Audiobook Title A Tale of Steel and Gunpowder Chapter 58 by Pixie Tokaizaki 14 Chapter 58 Shells The next day, Nira returned to the Dragon Breath Forge to finish her shotgun and make some ammunition for it. She still carried with her a bag that had her unfinished B-25 superposed shotgun, along with the electric motor and its corresponding attachments. She also brought with her the forging hammer her father had made, along with the debris ooze from the doom slimes yesterday. When she entered the building, though, it wasn't Hendrik manning the front desk, it was a tall, thin guy with black hair reading a book. When she approached the desk, the guy immediately dropped what he was doing and faced Nero with a nervous expression. H hello, welcome to the Dragon's Breath Forge. What can I do for you today? He greeted. Yes. I'm here to rent out a VIP station so I can finish my project, Nira said as she stood in front of the desk. Oh oh, let's call my dad since he's the only one who can admit people inside the VIP stations. He sheepishly said as he turned his back towards her and yelled at the hallway behind him, D dad, there's a girl here that wants to be admitted into a VIP station, coming. A voice echoed from the hallway, and seconds later. The tall stature of Hendrik was seen walking down the hallway and behind the front desk. Oh, Nira, welcome back, he said when he noticed Nira. He then pulled out the logbook from under the counter. Ye you know what to do. He then opened a book to a blank page where Nira could write her credentials. Nira then leaned forward to start writing in the book when she noticed the other guy, whom she assumed was Hendrik's son started blushing while he took glimpses between her and the book he was reading. While Nira was writing down her guild credentials and drank, Hendrik spoke while he stood in front of her. I see that ye have met me son, Derek, I guess? She answered back as she wrote. Did he do something weird while I was gone? He said while smirking. Dad, she heard Derek yell behind him. He was pretty nervous when I approached him. When she finished and stood back upright, Derek's face returned to normal as he breathed a sigh of relief. Nera then paid for four hours with forty silver coins. All right, follow me, Derek, keep an eye out while I'm gone. Or else I'm not letting ye buy that new novel of yours, he said the last part with a smirk as he walked out. Dad, he yelled again, I'm only kidding, he hey, you're so easy to tease. He then led Nira back down the basement. As Derek read his book, his face couldn't remove the image of Nira's large chest pressed against the countertop, so he just sat there, still blushing. Nira followed Hendrik as they went down the steps into the basement, as the first door was ready for her. He then kneeled down to turn the slot four times as he opened the door for her. Same as last time, leave when ye hear a whistle but after ye finish cleaning up, he said. Nera nodded as she entered the room. The room itself had nothing noteworthy since it was a copy of the room she last used. She then unwrapped the cloth from her shotgun as she wore the leather apron that was hanging on the wall. After that, she fired up the furnaces, which dripped the timer. The first order of business is making the ammunition using the debris ooze they collected yesterday. She placed the bottles on top of a table before pouring it all into a crucible. Then she placed the crucible inside the furnace, where it could crystallize. While it was crystallizing, Niran unveiled her electric drill and fitted it with the roller attachment. It consisted of a frame with two large, crushing metal wheels that turned when connected to the motor via rotating steel cogs. She then grabbed a brass bar and placed it inside another furnace that it was burning a low amount of charcoal so that it would be malleable to strike with a hammer. When the bar is in its plastic state, she pulled it out of the furnace and slowly hammered it into a long rod. Once the rod took shape, while it was still warm, she made it pass the rollers multiple times. The roller squeezed it into a thin sheet of brass afterwards. She then cut shapes in it using a special tool she made back at her father's forge, a thick, scissor-like tool that tore into the sheet. She cut 20 circles into the sheet that were 18.5 mm in diameter, and cut strips off of the paper she was working on that were an inch wide. She rolled the cut strips so they could turn into cylinders and attached the brass circles on one end to cap them off. She then hammered small circles underneath each cylinder, and in its place was a small disc made of steel. She checked back on the debris ooze and noticed that it had fully crystallized. 
So she pulled the crucible out of the furnace and started grinding it down to a fine dust. After that, she mixed it inside a steel pan with ground charcoal she got from the corner of the room, which served as the fuel for the furnaces, and with sulfur, which came from her separating it from fertilizer yesterday. When the mixture was ready, she placed the pan on the crafting station to be used for assembly later. Right now, she has to melt the lead ingot, which she got from the store outside earlier, into balls. She figured that the old mold she used to make the balls for her flintlock pistol and musket would work, so she brought them and slowly molded them. She ended up with 40 balls that were very small, about half a cm across, and a larger ball, about a cm across. She then gathered all of it for assembly. She first used parchment paper to line the inside of the cylinder, which went past the width of the cylinder. She placed the gunpowder inside the thin cylinder along with a wood made from wool she had bought earlier, and placed the half-centimeter lead balls inside. After that, she folded the end of the parchment inward to seal up the components and provide a tight fit. What she had in her hands was 12-gauge birdshot ammunition. That will fire off the small balls in a wide area and deal damage to multiple enemies when they are close enough. The bigger balls she made were for buckshot shells. Bigger balls mean better stopping power, but less spread. She eventually made all 20 shotgun shells for her B-25 superposed. She tested the fitting by loading one of them into the breech of the weapon. When she closed the breech, it was a perfect fit, and while carefully not applying pressure to the trigger, she opened it and pulled out the shell from the breech, she checked each shell for defects, and when she found none, she marked them which ones were birdshot and which ones were buckshot, ten of each. She then placed the shells inside the ammunition belt on her bandolier. She then pulled out the spent .44 cartridges for her model 1873 and started filling them up with gunpowder. She also did molded a few more bullets and placed it all in her ammunition storage. In the end she managed to craft 20 more .44 rounds for her Winchester model 1873. With the spare gunpowder and lead she had, she smiled in satisfaction that her weapon was almost complete, and its ammunition ready. Only the pistol-style grip remained.